Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to another live training session with NDD. Um, thank you for joining. Uh, today, we're going to be going through the Easy On PC Spirometer, um, going through this product training um, together. Um, I first of all wanted to say, if you're watching this as a recording or if you're watching it live, um, I apologize if there was any time um, time zone mix-ups. Um, you know, apologize for that. Thankfully, um, if you're registered, um, you'll definitely get this as a recorded session tomorrow. Um, so if it didn't work out for you to attend live, thank you for catching back up with us on the recording. Um, you can always see upcoming sessions and choose the time that works best to you on nddmed.com underneath live training. Um, we have one more live training on the Easy One Air scheduled in December, and then we're actually gonna transition into January into some of our other products and tests, and then eventually rotate back around to our spirometers. Um, but again, thank you so much for joining. I'm going to get us kicked off here. Um, just refresher on our objectives for today's live training. We're going to learn how to enter our patient data. Um, we're going to learn how to coach the patient through a maneuver. We're gonna focus primarily on the FVC maneuver, um, but we will do an example of an FVL as well. We're going to understand and how to interpret those quality messages that the Easy One Connect software provides to us between trials. We're going to look at some tips on how to interpret results and also look at are our results quality or not. And then, of course, at the end, we will open it up to an, um, an open Q&A um, with myself. I am Jamie Burgess, and I'm a respiratory therapist with NDD. So you'll have some time to ask some questions at the end. As I mentioned, we will have that live Q&A at the end of our session here. So if you could, there's both a question and a chat bar um, on your GoToWebinar uh, toolbox. Um, if you could put any questions or comments into those two places, those are monitored throughout the um, those are monitored throughout the webinar itself. Um, but then we will take the time again to read through those at the very end. All right. So I am going to go ahead and flip my screen over to the Easy One Connect software. Um, we're going to get started by just looking at a few things in um, the software and the setup, how to, how to initially set up your device, maybe if it's brand new to you. So this is the home screen when you first open up Easy One Connect, and you'll see that there are four primary tiles in the middle. In the upper left-hand corner, you'll see where you can enter your facility's information so that it shows on the home screen of your um, Easy One Connect software, and then also as the letterhead on your reports. Down in the lower right hand corner, you'll see that there is a little bit of an icon, a picture that looks a lot like the Easy on PC spirometer. And that is just showing that the spirometer is plugged in and ready to use. Just to the right of that, underneath the question mark, um, you'll see that there is the full digitized manual for the Easy on PC spirometer. And then you'll also see an option for videos. Um, in that tab, there are examples of instructor videos um, to patients and also instructions for um, technicians as well. So if you have time, take a look at those. Um, we have a lot of people that do share those um, patient videos with their patients prior to testing. So those are there if you ever need them. So we're gonna actually just start um, in the utilities menu and kind of look at where some of the different settings for the spirometer are located. You'll notice with the patient test and history tab, they're all kind of different pathways to get to the same place. Um, so again, if, I, if my workflow, the way we look, go through it looks a little bit different than yours, that's all right. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on utilities. I'm gonna click on configuration because that's where all of our primary settings are going to be located. And then it's going to bring me up to the first tab under the big tab general settings is going to be that header information. So if you um, this is where you would enter your facilities information to show up on Easy One Connect's home screen and then again on your reports as well. One other place to look under this general settings tab is underneath system settings. This is where you can come in and adjust the units of measurement, um, the patient entry format, the system language. So this is where you would come in and make those adjustments. I'm gonna hop over to the next large tab, which is the test tab. And you'll see that there's a lot of other sub tabs under this as well. So underneath the first sub tab, which is the general test settings, you'll see that there are a lot of different options that you can look through with your provider to see what is going to make the most sense for your facility. So again, under value selection, we recommend using the best values from all trials, which is what ATS and ERS recommends. You can add a um, to may have to manually stop the trial versus it being automatic. Under general settings, there are 
are lots of different things like showing the z-score column or showing the um, fbc fbv1 ratio and a percent um, again these are settings that you guys can decide on as a clinic and to customize your device to what you need the next sub tab over is the predicted value set and this would be where you would come in for spirometry and select what is how are we going to calculate what is normal for your patients as you can see there is a very 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 long list of available predicted value sets um, available in easy one connect again working with your provider um, you would just need to decide which predicted value set will work best for your patient population on the system interpretation, again, there are several different options. I have the Gold Hardy selected right now, but again, if you want system interpretation, so for the device to walk through, does the patient look obstructive, do they look restrictive, you can select the patient interpretation that best fits your needs, or you can also select to not have that interpretation um, visible on your report. All right, uh, still underneath this primary test tab, I'm gonna actually hop over to this F FVL tab and you'll see similar parameters both under the SVC and the MVV as well where we can go in and actually select what we see on the screen when we test and then what parameters are available on the printout as well so on FVC FVL there are a couple of extra um, selections that you can make underneath the preferred test type I have the FVC which is the exhalation only maneuver set is my preferred test type the FVL is still available on the test menu this just dictates what order those are on your test menu with FVC being listed first um, next to that um, is the applied spirometry standard again we do still have the 2005 standards as an option again recommending to follow ATS ERS 2019 standards and that is implemented on our software as well so on the parameter select I'm going to use FVC as an example but again you have the same parameter select boxes for SVC and MVV as well but if you click to select your FVC parameters You'll notice that the two boxes on the left hand side are what you will see when you are doing the test as a technician and then on the right hand side those two boxes are what is available and selected to be visible on the printout so if for some reason um you know i guess for an example the um, ambient humidity if you want that to be listed um, and that's very very important you can highlight any of these available parameters push them over to the report use the arrows to toggle them into the selection that you want or if your provider says actually i don't really care about ambient humidity anymore you could always select that and kick that back off of your report or your viewing screen as well once everything is in the order that you want you can click close and return back to the screen all right moving over into the de large device tab um, you'll notice here that I have a couple of different devices associated with my software, but your device um, should be that easy on PC. And once it's plugged in, you should have visibility to this icon in this place. Um, the serial number will be listed, the hardware version, the current firmware version, um, any of that information will be located here. Again, one, only when the device is actually plugged into the computer with Easy One Connect. Something else I wanna point out on this screen is this is where we would enable inline filter use. So if you are using the Easy One Filter SP for Spirette, which is the mouthpiece we use for the Easy On PC, you would want to make sure that you have inline filter use enabled. So looking here on the Easy On PC, I have the check mark checked to use an inline filter and I have the Easy One Filter SP um, selected. Um, all this does, checking this box, is it, it, it prompts the software to ask you before every test if the, you are using a filter or if you are not. If this is not selected, it is not going to ask you that question. And if you are using a filter, it could cause some variability in your results. So we always want to make sure that if you're using a filter, um, even if it's not every time, that you do have this enabled. All right, moving over to that report tab. 
Again, this is something that you can work with your providers to make sure that everything looks like you want it to look on your report. Under the general settings, there's the option to show the trial time, the normal range on the Z-score, to highlight abnormal results a different color. In the middle, you'll see that you can add your trending reports to your spirometry report. So if you have a patient that's coming in every six months, every two months, um, whatever the case may be, um, you can um, choose to add the, um, the trending graph to your report as well. There's the option to turn on or off lung age to show the predicted value points on your graphs and how you would want to ex um, export XML data if that's something that your facility um, utilizes. All right, the last tab that we're going to quickly cover in the utilities menu is this printer tab. Um, if you are printing your reports from your computer, an actual paper copy of your reports, you'll want to make sure that your printer is turned on and either um, connected via USB or, um, excuse me, a wireless connection to the computer that has the Easy One Connect software selected, or excuse me, installed. Once you, you confirm that that printer is on and connected, you can refresh the screen, and then that printer should appear here um, in your options. Right now, I am going to keep selecting um, to print to a PDF, but again, once you have this printer selected and saved, um, once you hit print on your reports, it would automatically go to that default printer. All right, before we exit back to the main menu, we always wanna make sure that we hit save and then it will automatically push us back out to the main menu. All right, I'm gonna stop showing my screen here for just a second so that I can be a little bit larger on your screen. Um, we're just gonna talk a little bit about test preparation all the different equipment that you will need to perform the spirometry test and some tips and tricks for your patients is, um, to just prepare your patients for the test as well. So obviously to perform your spirometry, you will need your computer that has the Easy um, One Connect software installed. You'll need your Easy On PC spirometer. You'll need a single patient use Spiret mouthpiece. Nose clips, especially if you are doing an inspiratory maneuver like the FVL or SVC, but we do recommend nose clips for every patient for every test. And then if your facility is using inline filters, you would need your um, Easy One Filter SP for, uh, for Spiret. All right, a few things to consider when preparing your patient for a spirometry test. Um, sometimes I know we can't predict if a patient is going to get spirometry um, ahead of their appointment or if it's something that's added um, during your workflow with the patient. But if you do know ahead of time, always make sure you talk with your physician on if there are any medications that should be held for a certain amount of time prior to being tested. Um, those could be rescue inhalers, maintenance drugs, other things, but always make sure that you talk with your um, physician to make sure that there, there isn't anything that you need to consider letting the patient know before they come in. Another thing to suggest to your patient is make sure that they do arrive in comfortable clothing, nothing that's too tight or restrictive, um, things we don't often think about, um, chest binders, abdominal binders, um, girdles, neckties, suspenders, really, really tight clothing, anything that would prohibit the patient from taking a huge, big, deep breath in and then blasting it out as hard and as fast as they can. Um, we also sometimes get questions about dentures. Um, if the dentures are well fitted and secured in your patient's mouth, then they will actually have a much better seal on the mouthpiece with those dentures remaining in place. Um, if they are ill-fitted at all, too big, too small, not properly secured, we would want the patient to remove those so that then they could make a good tight seal on the mouthpiece without worrying about um, the adjustment of their um, gum line. Um, again, talk with your physician about if there are any contraindications for your patients, if they've had a recent abdominal surgery, um, you know, other examples like that, just so that you can make sure that it's safe for your patient to perform spirometry. You always want to have a stationary chair in the room. You want to make sure that the patient um, typically is seated unless it is easier for them to stand. And you always want to also monitor the patient's posture throughout the test as well. Um, one example that we'll give later is um, when a glottic closure happens during a test. And so many times it's um, posture related when the patient takes a big deep breath in and then wads themselves up in a little ball, um, essentially cutting off their airway during the test. So we do want to make sure that their chin is elevated off of their chest, they're sitting up nice and tall, and that they are comfortable to perform the test. So I am going to go ahead and switch back over to the Easy One Connect software, and we're going to look at how to enter a patient into the system.
So let me go ahead and share my screen again here. So we are back at the home screen for Easy One Connect. Um, and it, like I told you guys, these patient tests and history tabs, they're all kind of different doors to get to the same location. But for our example today, I'm gonna add the patient by going into the patients tab. You'll see here I have quite the list of different uh, patients in my Easy One Connect software. Once a patient is entered into the system, they do stay in the system unless they are deleted off. So if you have a patient that is coming in for a recurring visit, you can use the search bar in the upper right hand corner. You can search by first name, last name or patient ID to get that previously tested patient to come back up on your screen. Or if this is a brand new patient coming for spirometry the first time, we will need to enter them into the system. And down in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see a tile that says new with a plus sign. And we're gonna click on that. So this is the patient entry portal. The only things that 100% absolutely have to be filled in are these five items that are starred on this first page. Of course, your facility might want to put extra information into this, and that's just something that you'll want to speak with you about your with your provider. You'll see under smoking history, there are places to put if the patient's a smoker, how many years they've been smoking, have they been diagnosed with asthma, have they been diagnosed with COPD. Under history, you can talk who ordered this test, were they referred to your physician from another facility? Under environment, we can note if the patient lives at a residence of high altitude or any other comments that we might need to leave um, about the patient. But back to this general tab, again, just making sure that the items are um, entered that absolutely need to be. And these items are one patient identifier. And then the other four items are what we need to determine uh, where that patient fits in their predicted value set. Um, so are, are they normal or are they not compared against other people of their sex at birth, their ethnicity, their age, and their height? So I'm gonna go ahead and just enter a patient here. All right. And I have height and in inches selected. Had it in centimeters too long. All right. Um, so once we have this done, we've confirmed that all of our information is correct. We can go ahead and click OK. And you'll see that it's going to push us back to the screen um, that we were just at with the patient we just entered highlighted. We can also double check that we are testing the correct patient by verifying that the patient that is highlighted matches the patient that is showing down in the lower left hand corner of our screen, just to confirm that we are in the right patient account. Um, before we move into actually testing the patient, I wanted to go through just a couple of scenarios that we do get calls on frequently um, about when patient information gets entered correctly and what we can and can't do to correct that information. So as I mentioned just a moment ago, we always want to make sure that we are testing on the correct patient profile. That is one thing that we cannot fix. If we happen to test the wrong patient under the wrong name, we are not able to move that report. So always, always double check that you do have the correct patient pulled up. Another situation that you might run into is if you need to edit a patient's information. So I just entered this patient 56189 into the system. I realized that I did my math wrong, like I almost did, and entered and entered their height incorrectly. I haven't tested the patient yet, but I need to make that change. So with this patient highlighted, I can click on the edit button. I can make my change and I can click OK. No harm, no foul. It's updated and we're ready to move on. Um, I'm also going to go ahead and swap over to another one of my patient profiles that I have a lot of tests on. And I do this because I, there's two more examples when the edit button comes into play. One is there's been a dramatic change in one of those patient demographics since the last time they were in. They've had a loss in height. They've had a significant weight gain or weight loss if you're entering weight. Um, and we need to make sure that any tests moving forward on this patient have been altered. So I'm gonna go ahead and click that edit button again. I'm going to make my change again. Maybe I grew, maybe I grew an inch here. And so now I am 68 inches, but that doesn't affect any of the tests that I have done previous or prior to today. So at this point, all I would want to do would be to click okay. Now any tests moving forward will have that new height applied. The third scenario for the edit button is brings in that um, show existing or update existing test button that you see here. So 
I miscalculated the patient's height. Um, they did their test and they are in their car driving home. And I need to adjust that height on the test that that patient just did. So in this situation, I would make my adjustment and then to select to update existing tests. This causes it to recalculate that height in either a selected test that you just did or all of the tests on this patient. As you can see, I have a ton of tests on this patient. So I wanna update the height on just this one test, okay? From 67 to, and again, I've already adjusted this account so many times to 68. I would make my change and then either select to update the existing or all, all tests to that or to update the test that I just selected to that new height so that our predicted value set can be calculated correctly. Again, if you have any questions on that, feel free to reach out or type a question into the question bar and we can elaborate on that more later. I just always like to go through the edit button just because we do get some support calls on what to do in those situations. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and go back out to the main menu and now we're about ready to test. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen again here for just a moment so that I'm a little bit larger on your screen and we're gonna get ready to test. So we have all of our supplies assembled. We have our spirometer, our spirette mouthpiece, our nose clips. And for this example, I will use a filter today, the Easy One Filter SP. So when you open up your Spirep mouthpiece, you'll notice that there is the option just to tear the plastic halfway. That is just so that you can keep the plastic on the front part of the mouthpiece. But of course, we should always be wearing gloves when we do spirometry. So if you happen to take the plastic all the way off, that's okay too. When you take off the mouthpiece, you'll notice that there is a printed arrow on one side of that mouthpiece. When you insert the mouthpiece into the spirometer, you'll notice that there is also a printed arrow on the patient side of the handle. The mouthpiece only goes in one way and it's so that those arrows line up when the mouthpiece is inserted. If you happen to not get the mouthpiece inserted all the way or it is upside down, the software will give you an error that your spirette is inserted incorrectly. As an additional step, if you are using an inline filter, that goes on the back side of the spirette mouthpiece and it just twists on. Be cautious when you put your mouthpiece, or excuse me, when you place your filter that you don't pop your mouthpiece out of the correct position. So twisting it on is always a really good idea. All right, so now your spirometer is set up and ready to use. I have my nose clip set on the side here. And so now we're gonna discuss the actual FVC test. So the force vital capacity test. Um, I always tell patients we are trying to measure how much air you can move in and out of your lungs and how quickly you can move that air in and out of your lungs. This helps us identify um, deficits that could be an obstructive um, pattern or a restrictive pattern. Um, again, you know, talking with your, your physician and the actual interpretation set that you guys use. Um, but generally we are looking at those two things when we perform spirometry. Um, even sick patients, patients um, that have a chronic lung disease um, are still able to give us a quality spirometry test. Even if the results aren't super high for that particular patient, we know that they can give us a good quality test that will give us an accurate picture of their lung health. So when we have a patient do this FVC maneuver, there are really just two parts to this test. We want the patient to be seated in their stationary chair, sitting up nice and straight, their chin elevated off their chest. We'll have them make a good tight seal with their lips around the mouthpiece with their teeth on top and their tongue on the bottom, making sure that they're not blocking the mouthpiece in any way with their tongue or any other part of their mouth. On the mouthpiece, we'll have the patient take a big, big deep breath in and then immediately blast it out as hard and as fast as they can. We wanna encourage the patient to keep blowing and keep blowing and keep blowing until they come to a point of expiratory plateau, meaning no more air is coming out of their lungs. We can visualize this on our volume time graph during the test, but the software is going to automatically end the trial for us once, that, once the patient has reached that point of expiratory plateau. Your patients will feel like they are out of breath long before they are out of breath. And it is our job as their coach to continue to have them pushing out that air, um, squeezing out every little last bit of air that they can until the software ends the trial for us. 
Um, if you have been doing spirometry for a long time, you might remember with the 2005 spirometry standards, there used to be a six second minimum. Um, a patient had to at least blow out for six seconds. A lot of times then people would just end the test. Um, which is why that was removed. So now the, the test does not end or it's not an acceptable maneuver until the patient hits that point of expiratory plateau, meaning all the air that they brought in is now all the way out of their lungs. Again, I will show an example of an FVL maneuver, which is very, very similar to the FVC, but it is actually adds the inspiratory side of that flow volume loop. Again, the test is performed almost identically, but instead, once we get to that point of expiratory plateau, the patient has blasted out all of their air. There's no air left. The software will prompt us and it'll tell us that the patient has reached expiratory plateau and to have them take a deep breath back in to complete the curve. And again, the coaching bar does walk you through each step of that in the software. All right, so I am going to go ahead and show my screen again here, and we're gonna actually go into that FVC test. So again, I already have a patient selected. Um, you can confirm that by looking in the lower left-hand corner and you see that that uh, patient ID 1234 is selected. So I can go into the test menu. From here, you see all of the different tests that um, are available on Easy One Connect. You'll see the two that we have talked the most about, the FEC and the FBL. You'll also see the slow vital capac capacity, the MVV. There's options for bronchial propagation. And then there's also an option to import external PFT. If you're doing MIP and MAP on a separate device, device or a six minute walk, um, you can plug those values in as an external PFT so that they show up on your test report. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and click on FVC. The very first thing it is going to ask me to confirm is, am I using that inline filter for testing or am I not? I am using the inline filter today, so I'm going to select to test with an inline filter. The next thing it is doing is this point-to-point -point ultrasound needs to set to zero before we start the test. So to block that spirette mouthpiece until the software tells us to start the test. And again, you can either use that plastic that we only tore to halfway on the mouthpiece. You can use a gloved hand on either side, just as long as there's no air moving through the mouthpiece during this very quick zeroing of the equipment. So I have the spirette blocked. I'm gonna click okay. And then the coaching bar will tell us to start the test. So again, I'm gonna have the patient make a good tight seal with their teeth on top, tongue on bottom, big deep breath in, immediately blast it out as hard and as fast as you can. You're gonna keep blowing and keep blowing and keep blowing until the software ends the trial for you. Awesome. So you'll see there that the trial did end automatically as soon as I got to that point of expiratory plateau. That is something that you can visualize in this volume time curve here. As it becomes more and more and more and more flat, that is something that we can watch to help the patient know how close they are to that point of patient, or excuse me, of expiratory plateau. I'm gonna point out just a few things on the screen here and then toggle back to some slides and then we'll get through this trial all together here. So you'll see right here in the middle, underneath test information, it has a session quality grade, both for FEV1 and FVC. That FEV1 is how much air did that patient get out in the first second of exhalation? Because healthy patients should be able to get out about 80 to 85% of their total capacity in that first second. So that's something that we watch very, very closely. And you'll notice that both of those parameters right now have a letter E grade, which we're going to talk a little bit about session quality grades here in a moment. But just remember, with spirometry, we have to have a minimum of three acceptable and reproducible trials for the software to end the session for us, meaning we have met all the criteria we need to, and this is a good quality spirometry test. So when you see that letter E after the first trial, remember you only have one trial and session quality is looking at your test as a whole. So that grade will continue to move up as you add acceptable and reproducible trials. 
right next to that is the system interpretation. Um, if you have an interpretation selected in those utility, uh, in that utility menu we looked at earlier, it will start to build that preliminary system interpretation. Right now, mine does say mild obstruction, which is accurate because I do have asthma. Right next to that, you'll see that there is a place where you can click and to enter a comment. Um, this can be anything from, you know, patient tolerated the test well. If you are doing post bronchodilator testing, you can put the dosage of your albuterol Zopinex in there. Um, whatever you do in there to communicate to your physician um, at the end of the test, you can use that comment bar. All right, down here in the lower left hand corner, you'll see that those parameters that I had selected in the utilities are showing. Again, I only have one trial right now, so it's showing my best first, which again, I only have one trial, so everything is pulled from this one trial. Our lower limit of normal, the z-score, the percent predicted, our actual predicted number, and then our trial values will start to build. You'll notice on this little green smiley face, if you click on him, it really does give you a very detailed explanation of why a trial was acceptable, usable, or not usable. So you'll see on this one, everything, all of the acceptability criteria passed. There was nothing that failed. And you'll see that there are some recommended manual checks um, that you can try with your patient if you continually have issues. I'm gonna go ahead and hop over to my PowerPoint for just a moment so that we can look at this a little bit closer. So looking at FBC and FBB1 um, within every trial is something that's new to those ATS ERS 2019 guidelines. And the overall trial is represented um, by these smiley faces. So obviously if you have a green smiley face, it indicates that both the FBB1 and the FBC for that trial were acceptable. If it's yellow, it indicates that both parameters are at least usable, but, but both are not acceptable. And then obviously the sad red face is indicates at least one of those parameters is not usable at all. Now with our software, we typically don't recommend deleting trials only because sometimes a trial that is otherwise not fantastic might be the best value for any, like a given parameter. Um, and so our software is only gonna take those three best um, trials and it's gonna take the best values from all trials combined. So deleting trials, again, you are you can do that. You can move acceptability around um, if, you think, if you think that you need to, but again, our software is gonna follow that ATS ERS 2019 algorithm exactly um, as far as was it acceptable, was it usable or was it not usable? And you know that it's only gonna pull those best values. So again, here's an up close view on um, that kind of more detailed, um, and this is kind of an example of a, of a yellow smiley face, which is um, the combination that is shown on your screen is actually very, very common. Um, when you click on that smiley face, it, it kind of gives you that really detailed evaluation on FBC and FB1, um, and it includes that analysis of pass fail. Um, like I said, you can override acceptability, um, but again, I, I typically don't recommend doing that. It's definitely more um, beneficial to continue to add trials um, so that the um, software can pull from all trials listed. All right, on this one, I always like to point out it's a great example. You can see on this one, the FEV1 was predictable, so they blasted out hard and fast, but then the FBC was only usable they did not make it all the way to the point of expiratory plateau, which is why this is a usable versus an acceptable test. All right. Um, the other component to, is it is it acceptable, but then also is it reproducible? Um, I, I feel like we do get a lot of questions about this because people will say, I have three or four green smiley faces and it's not ending my trial for me. Um, why, why does it want me to keep adding trials? Everything looks good. And 99% of the time, it's an issue with that reproducibility. Does one trial look like the next, look like the next? And this really is the only time that I encourage, I guess for, the, for lack of a better word, the use of that um, deleting a trial. Um, because if you do have one that is very, very, 
much, much different than all of your other trials. Um, getting that outlier out of the way to fix your reproducibility is something that you might look at doing. So as you can see here, the goal is to perform at least three acceptable and reproducible trials. Uh, repeatability for FEVC and FE1 is reached when the difference between those two largest is less than 0.15 liters. And it's just a little bit different for pediatrics where that is less than 0.1 liters or 10% of the higher value, whichever is greater. So this is how we determine what is acceptable and what, or excuse me, what is reproducible and what is not. All right. I'm going to go ahead and flip back over to Easy One Connect for a couple of minutes here, and then we'll go back and talk a little bit more about that, what makes a trial acceptable here in just a minute. So I'm going to go ahead and add a trial. Remember, nose clips on, teeth on top, tongue on bottom, big deep breath in, blast it out hard and fast, keep blowing until the device ends the trial for you. Awesome. It's telling me good effort do next. The coaching bar also could give me feedback on individual trials, like telling me to take a deeper breath, to blow out faster, to blow out longer, not to hesitate. So making sure I immediately blast out hard and fast. So the coaching bar really does give you that real time feedback between each trial. Before I complete this FVC trial, I'm actually going to pop back out and give a quick example of the FVL test just so that you guys can see the differences. Again, the test is performed almost exactly the same, except for when the patient reaches plateau, another coaching message will show up telling us to take a big deep breath in, then to complete the flow volume loop. So I will go ahead and show you guys an example. Again, I'm switching tests, so it's asking me again, am I using a filter? It's asking me again to block the spirette until prompted to blast out. All right, and keep an eye on that coaching bar because that really is the biggest difference between these two tests. Awesome. So you can see that the coaching bar did prompt me to go ahead and take that second deep breath in to finish the trial. Everything else is the same on FBL. You still have to do a minimum of three acceptable reproducible trials. You want to continue adding trials until the software tells you that the session is complete, meaning that every um, all of the ATS criteria has been met before you move on. All right. All right, before we do this last trial here, wrapping up this test, I wanted to go um, a little bit more in detail with this quality grading and how we determine what is acceptable and what is not. So this is the grading chart from the ATS ERS um, 2019 standardization. This is not um, NDD's grading chart that they came up with on their own. Um, this is directly pulled from the standard. So if you ever have questions on why it's not finishing a session for you or why you're missing parameters or have a bad grade, this is absolutely where the answer is. So if you have a C grade on your session quality, that means that you have two acceptable and the reproducibility is within 2.2 liters of each other um, versus what an A is, three or more with um, a 0.1 five liter difference between that. And you can also see this on your reports as well. You'll see that session quality grade and you'll also see that variability um, that it's talking about to make sure that it lines up for repeatability as well. All right, so we talked a little bit about what makes it reproducible. Now, what are the components that make an acceptable maneuver? And the first is that explosive start. We do not want the coaching bar to tell us not to hesitate. Again, most patients can get around 80 to 85% of all of their air out in that first second. And so we need to make sure that it is explosive start, no hesitation to make sure that that FEV1 comes from a maximal effort. Um, we can talk a lot about back extrapolated volume and what that means, but really the drive home message here is making sure that they take their big deep breath and then immediately blast it out as hard and as fast as they can. This is not really a relaxed maneuver. Your patients are not going to ever breathe this way um, in their everyday life. Um, it is something that we are that we have to coach them through 
and understand what sh what that test should look like. So making sure that they understand it is not a relaxed maneuver, it is forced, it is pushing out hard and fast every last bit of air. The next one is that glottic closure or an abrupt stop to your maneuver. We don't want to make sure that we have a glot, excuse me, we want to make sure that we do not have a glottic closure or an abrupt air stop in that first or after the first second of expiration. So we again, this is just this would impede our ability to measure that full FVC. Um, and a lot of times this is posture related. Um, it's the patient folding their neck down, bending themselves in half when they do the maneuver, um, making sure that their posture is good throughout the entire maneuver. Um, I know that we always say to make sure that they are in a stationary chair. One exception to this would be if somebody has a really hard time taking this big deep breath in because they have a larger belly, um, they could be pregnant, they just could carry their weight in their belly, to where we want to do whatever we can to make sure that the patient can take the biggest breath in possible and blast it out. All right, the next one is also very, very common. I'm sure you guys have seen this if you've done spirometry for any length of time, but that's that cough. We especially want to make sure that there is no cough in that first second of expiration, because again, that would greatly affect the accuracy of our FEV1 maneuver. So coughs are pretty easy to identify, not only looking at your patient, but you can see the curve dips on the waveform as well. Um, again, I don't recommend deleting curves because there always might be something in that particular trial that you might need later, but I stopping the maneuver, giving the patient a drink of water, and then having them repeat it is always a good idea. All right, extra breaths. This one always cracks me up. Um, patients think they're very sneaky, and it does. It gets very, very hard when you feel like you're out of breath to continue to push air out of your lungs. So patients will try to sneak little breaths in, um, either the corners of their mouth or through their nose. And this is where nose clips really come into play. And then making sure that you are monitoring that the patient has a good tight seal on that mouthpiece for the entire maneuver. All right, I'm going to click back over to Easy One Connect. We are going to go back into the FVC test. So we have two acceptable and reproducible trials right now. So we're going to add a third to complete this trial. One thing that I want to point out, if you do post bronchodilator um, trials, if you do a spirometry test, give a medication, wait a, a certain amount of time, and then come back and retest to see if there was a change with medication, there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. Um, one is just on that results screen that will be back on here in just a moment. There's an option to add a post-test, or if like me, you popped out of this particular patient, you went to taste, test another patient, you needed to go back to the home screen for any reason, any time within 24 hours that you re-enter a patient's profile under the same test, it's going to ask you why you're doing that. Am I adding a trial? Am I adding a post bronchodilator test? Or am I starting a brand new test? And for this example, we're just gonna add a trial to the test that we already had um, performed earlier in this training. All right, it's confirming that I'm still using a filter. It's gonna have me block the spirette since I did exit the test and come back in. All right, and one last trial. So teeth on top, tongue on bottom, big depth, deep breath in, immediate blast out, hard and fast. Excellent, and I knew it was gonna yell at me. One thing about being a um, PFT educator, when you have asthma, sometimes it makes things a little bit funny. So it is telling me to take a deeper breath. Again, I have three green smiley faces, but it's not completing this trial for me because between this trial and the others, I had a little bit of variability there. So I am doing the one example of when I delete a trial, and that's when I have one crazy outlier. Awesome, so it's telling me session complete, great job. I have three acceptable and reproducible trials. Looking at my session quality, I have an A grade for both FBV1 and FVC. 
my variability is within range. The system interpretation says I have a mild obstruction, which is accurate because I have asthma and I'm ready now to move on um, with the test. Again, here's that place where we can add a post bronchodilator trial straight from the results screen, or we can do it from the test menu like I just showed you guys. And again, the rules for post bronchodilator, exactly the same from pre. Um, th minimum of three acceptable reproducible trials. You want an A or a B grade at the end and um, three, you know, three green smiley faces. All right. So we're going to go ahead and go take a look at the report. So I'm going to go ahead. Um, once you have your device set up, you know what your report template um, is. You use the same one every time. If you're connected directly to a printer, you can always just hit this print button and send it directly. If you want to view the report, you can go ahead and click that report tile. And in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, there are several default um, templates that you can choose from. Um, I'm not sure which one is going to pop up on my screen, and if it's a custom report, so I'm going to swap over to our standard FVC FVL report. Um, on this standard report, you'll notice that the letterhead is the information that you entered in the um, utilities menu. The patient information is next followed by how we're reading the test, what was the date, what interpretation, what predicted value set are we using? And then after that is going to be our actual data. If you do a post bronchodilator test, it will generate just to the right of the pre and will show up in green. On this, you can see it has my best trial or my three best trials with the best values from each trial displayed in this first column. Underneath this, you'll see my session quality. You'll see that system interpretation. You'll see that I am using an inline filter. You'll see my Z-score, which is how am I, um, if normal is zero, if that is where my predicted value is, how good or bad do I deviate from that normal um, that is supposed to be normal for me based on my predicted values. You can see my small airway values are a little bit low. No one get worried. It is decided to be very cold in Southwest Missouri for this asthmatic girl. So no worries there, guys. Um, but you can get, that's a really a good visual for patients to see where, um, where they are on a little bit of a graph. Below that, you'll see all of those different trials are displayed both in the flow volume loop and in the volume time curve. Um, I do spirometry all day, every day. So it's a little bit hard to see that there are three trials listed there just because my trials look very, very consistent um, just because I do them so often. Um, your patients will probably have a little bit more variability than what you see here on my screen. All right, once you have the report, um, the desired report selected, again, from several different standard layouts in the drop down here. Again, if you're directly connected to a printer, all you have to do is hit the print button. If you are saving as a PDF, dragging and dropping into an EMR or a research software or any other um, database that is not a local storage here on this software, you can click on print menu and you'll see that there is a button that says export to. You can select how you want the file um, to be saved, most commonly a PDF, and then you can save it um, in any designated place, name the file and save it on your computer. Again, then it can be drag, um, drug and dropped into an EMR, into a patient folder, or whatever your workflow procedure, uh, whatever that looks like for your facility. Um, there are several ways to get the reports off of the device if you're exporting an XML or have a direct connection with your EMR where orders send um, are sent back and forth automatically. Obviously, this doesn't pertain to those situations, um, but just know if your workflow looks a little bit different, that's okay, because there are lots of different ways to get the reports off of the device. All right. Well, I am going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen here for just a moment. And um, I think that um, we've wrapped up everything going through this FVC test on the Easy on PC. And I do want to take these last 10 minutes really to go through and make sure that you guys have questions answered and that you're comfortable with this moving um, to test patients. So Bianca, I think you're joining me today for Q&A. Um, do we have any questions? Hi, Jamie. Nice job. Thank you. Yes, we have quite a few questions rolling in, so right. um, I'll go right ahead and get started. Um, so I do have somebody here asking about the placement of the mouthpiece. So they're currently okay. performing FVC testing and they have their patient take a deep breath in, then insert, insert the spirette. So any recommendations on um, mouthpiece 
placement before testing? Yeah. Absolutely. We get this question a lot, you know, and, and there's really not a right or a wrong way. It's what works for you and how you coach in the patient. In my experience, I have far fewer issues by doing the entire maneuver on the mouthpiece like I demonstrated. Um, a lot of times when we take our deep breath, then seal, then blast, sometimes we can lose some volume. Um, while we're kind of fumbling to make that good tight seal. Um, sometimes we can get a do not hesitate because maybe they don't have their mouthpiece um, all the way sealed tightly when they start to blast out. So again, there's not a right or a wrong way to do um, that kind of start of test. Some people like to do some normal tidal breathing prior to their test and our software will recognize that if you have the patient do normal breaths first. Um, so it really is just your preference. Again, I teach to do the entire maneuver on the mouthpiece because I have found it to be less problematic, um, but that doesn't mean that that is the case for every technician and every patient. So if that has been working for you, you're not having issues with your FVC or getting do not hesitate orders, um, or excuse me, um, errors from the device, I think that it's totally fine to continue to do that. Again, this is just how I have found that it works best with our device. All right, awesome. Thanks, Jamie. Um, I have another question here regarding um, ethnicity and what to do if the ethnicity of the patient is not available as an option. All right, so this one, this has kind of been a little bit of a hot topic, and I'm sure that a lot of people on the call know um, that GLI, that Global Lung Index, they are kind of moving to a more um, race neutral position. Um, as they have been able to test larger and larger and more diverse um, populations. Um, the answer to this again is there might not be a right or a wrong answer for your patient. If their ethnicity is not listed, you always have the option to pick other, um, which sets kind of everybody to an even playing field. Um, if you're, cho I have some, um, some customers that choose other for all of their patients because they don't wanna correct for ethnicity. Um, if you are in an area where you have a really high concentration of a certain ethnic group, you might also look into with your physician on, is there a predicted value set out there that is specific to this group? Um, as you saw in the utilities, we have a really, really long list of predicted value sets or you know what could be normal for any given patient population. Um, Again, I, I do recommend GLI, the Global Lung Index. We have the 2012 implemented on our software currently um, in a very, very short amount of time in our next software update. Um, in January, we will have that GLI 2020 available, which does bring it to a point of race neutrality. Um, but again, selecting other is always an option. But again, if it is a consistent um, patient population for you, you and your provider might want to look into some of the other predicted value ranges that are listed to see if there's maybe something that would fit that population um, better than selecting a race neutral position within GLI or NHANES. All right, good, thank you. Um, I have another one here. Somebody that's using our spirometer for research purposes and has a large number of subjects and is asking mm -hmm. if we have any uh, information on exporting large amounts of data. Yes, so, you know, there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, you know, most commonly for research, um, they will normally do an XML file um, export into um, whatever server that they're using for their study, um, whatever their study database is. If you have an overreading platform that your um, overreaders are using for, uh, for quality and for actual reading of your results, um, there are several different options for that. Um, and that is something um, just so that you guys know, if we don't get to your question um, or if I, if I don't quite hit the mark answering your questions, once we wrap up, I can actually see who asked each question and it has your contact information that you registered for the webinar with. Um, and so especially like for this specific question, um, I will definitely find you in my list and make sure that I follow up. Um, I do work with our research customers here at NDD. And so I would be happy to kind of help see what option for that bulk export is going to work the best. Um, because again, exporting a PDF at a time um, in a situation like that is pretty tedious. Um, so I can definitely assist with um, like an XML format or whatever your research database, whatever type of file it will accept. Um, we can definitely follow up um, after this um, on that question. Perfect, thank you. 
Um, another question here, I'll just go ahead and read this one as is in closed spirometry, sometimes I ask the patient to take an air before reaching the plateau. Any recommendation to improve this error and avoid not meeting the criteria for completion of the test? Right. So as you saw, if we have our patient take extra breaths during the maneuver, it's going to kick that maneuver out for FVC, um, just because that is something that is highlighted as um, not acceptable um, with, you know, either before or after that first second of expiration. Um, and again, this is not an easy test for patients to perform. Um, I mean, I, I am asthmatic. I am, my, my lung function is on a good day, you know, as you can you saw it in the background, you know, in the, in the mid eighties on my percent predicted. Um, but I still can do a good quality test. So your patients will, they will feel like they are out of air before they are out of air. And being that coach, making sure that they understand that before and that you are going to encourage them to keep pushing out every last little bit of air that they can. Uh, because on our software, if you take a deep, if you take a second deep breath in or take another little breath in, it's going to end your trial for you. And you're probably only going to have a usable or a not usable FVC. Um, so just encouraging them and setting the expectation you're going to feel like you're out of air, making sure that you're coaching them to keep pushing, keep pushing. There's more air. There's still air coming out. Keep going, keep going. Um, I, you know, the coaching side of that really does fall on us to make sure that they understand um, that it's, you know, it's not, it's not the most enjoyable test. They're going to feel like they're out of air before they are, but that you need them to keep pushing until the software senses that no air is coming out because the second it reaches that plateau, um, it's going to end the trial for us. So we need to just, again, continue to have them um, add, excuse me, b blowing out and pushing out that air until the software prompts us to stop. All righty. Awesome, Jamie. Um, I think that's it. I do have a few people asking about the recording. So I do believe it goes okay. out automatically after yeah. the webinar is complete. Um, but I think I think we have them all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the recording, um, the email that you registered with, it'll be an email from GoToWebinar. And normally it's about 24 hours after the event. So it'll be about this time tomorrow when those emails go out. Um, so whether you were able to attend live, not live, a portion of live. Um, if you registered at all, you will get that recording in your email tomorrow. All right. Well, if there are no more questions, um, I, again, just want to thank everybody for hopping on. Um, keep an eye on nddmed.com underneath the live training page. Um, again, we are excited. We're going to be adding some um, live training sessions for DLCO for multiple breath washout. Um, again, and then spirometry on our device um, on the Easy One Air. Um, on the Easy on PC, all of those are going to start rotating in in 2024, just so that we make sure that we are hitting all of our tests um, and offering live training as often as we're able. Um, so again, thank you guys for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me once the event is over. Um, if there's any questions that we that I missed, and I will follow up with my clinical trial friend here in a little while, um, I'll definitely be reaching out. So again, have a wonderful um, rest of your Tuesday, and we will see you at another live training session soon. Thanks so much. Have a great day.